That is, uh, uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, Reverend Billy Graham turns 95 years old, and that's his focus of My Hope America. If you do not have a packet, you're on the front pew, if you're interested in participating in this, and don't think it's a late start, you can still certainly be a part of this, is sharing the gospel with people who are not saved. And that packet there on the front pew, you don't need to grab one, it certainly, uh, it certainly tells you what to do. So this crusade in America will be starting this week, so you should be able to turn on your television and see Billy Graham all over TV, because he's bought a lot of TV time with that. Turn your Bibles to the book of John. John chapter 20, or I'm sorry, John chapter 12, verses 20 through 36. Did you miss Jesus? Jesus showed up at our church this past week. A lot of lives were changed. A lot of people got saved. And a lot of decisions were certainly made. And I had the opportunity um, this past week to go out to dinner several times with Brother Bailey as well as talk to him and really listen to this man of God share from his heart because someone like Brother Bailey, he travels around America preaching in all sorts of churches. He sees everything. He does crusades. He does revivals. He does Harvest Sundays. He fills in for me. He's all over the place, not just here in Atlanta area. He's, um, like he said, he's preached in 30 countries and 49 states. And he was telling me, you know, he's going to preach a, in January, he's going to be in Alaska preaching a, a revival of the same church that's invited him back 25 years in a row. And he says every time they go, hundreds of, he comes up there, they always, they, this church is in Anchorage, and they run a couple thousand people, it's the largest church in Alaska. And they invite Bailey Smith every January to come. It's freezing cold, he says, because of the hair. And the church is packed with hundreds of people every time. Preaches the same old messages over and over again, and everyone gets saved. So um, it's certainly very powerful. Before we read this passage here, I want to share with you what Brother Bailey shared with me, what his suggestions are for First Baptist in New Orleans. Because I think these suggestions apply to not just our church, but even in your individual life. What does it mean to be a church member and be a part of First Baptist Moreland? Brother Bailey shared the story that when he was the pastor of the largest church in Oklahoma, and this was a church that um, it grew from a couple thousand people to 20,000 people. He's on the radio, on TV, uh, preaches to thousands of people. I mean, just every Sunday they're baptizing people. You know, I just want to put it in perspective. His church averaged 1,100 baptisms a year. The largest church in Georgia for baptisms is First Baptist Woodstock, which baptizes 600 a year. You know, a lot of people can sit around and talk about church growth. But they have no idea what they're talking about. They might have a PhD. They might have a doctorate degree in it. But Billy Smith's a little bit different. He's actually grown a church. He knows what church growth is. He speaks from experience. So when a man like Brother Bailey comes and talks, He's really worth listening to because he's seen it all. And this is really, we're about to get into these three suggestions to our church from Brother Bailey. He says, you know, there was one day when I was uh, pastoring First Southern Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. I pulled up at this house. Someone asked me to visit this man because he went, he averaged 30 visits a week at their church. If you were a deacon or a staff member at First Southern Baptist Church, you had to visit 10 people week. Now, his business, you cannot go knock on the door and the person's not home. You write on their card, not home, and turn it in. Uh-uh. You had to visit 10 people who were home and you spoke to. That counted as a visit. Not home is not a visit. So he was active in knocking on doors. In fact, Acts 20, 20 tells us that they went from house to house telling people about Jesus. Says he went to this home, someone asked him to visit, because he told his church every week, says, please give me names and addresses of people you want me to visit. I'll be more than happy on Saturday to visit people. On Saturday, he didn't play up, he didn't do sports, he went knock on doors. He'd bring a deacon or a staff member with him, and they went out for a few hours every day. And he had a list of cards and people he would go visit. And then he says, usually the next day, those people would come to church. He says, if you visit them too early in the week, they might forget. But you knock on their door on Saturday and say, I'll see you tomorrow. They'll remember and they'll be there. He says he went to a home and this guy was an alcoholic. He pulls up and this home's falling apart. It's bad condition. The man, he walks up, doesn't have a shirt on, has a beard in his hand watching football. And he pulls up and here he is, the largest pastor. 
pastor in the state of Oklahoma. He's in a nice car in a nice suit. He's with another deacon. And they pull up a well-dressed and groomed. And he's walking up to this home. And it says, Satan hit him. He had some thoughts. Do I really want this man in my church? I mean, look at him. His home's falling apart. He has no money. He has a drinking problem. No one wants. He can't even put his clothes on. I see him through the window. I know he's going to be home. And he says, at one moment, he was tempted to think, let's just get in the car and go home and just call it a day. I mean, we we visited enough. Do we really want this guy? I mean, is he going to fit in? He's not like most people. Here. And he was tempted at that point. He'll remember. He says, here I am, pastor of Barthes Church. God has used me great. You know, what's this man going to make one difference at First Southern Baptist Church in Oklahoma City? And at that point, the Lord spoke to him because he was tempted to just stop and say, you know what? This guy's been drinking. He, he's not going to be receptive. It could get out of hand. He doesn't. You can't lead a drunk to Christ. He was tempted to say that. The Lord spoke to him and said, Brother Bailey, you were once that man. You were a lost man. You might not have been in the condition he's in, but someone told you about Jesus. Someone took the time to share the gospel with you. And if I can save you, Brother Bailey, I can save that drunk sitting there watching college football Saturday with a beer in his hand. He walked in that home, knocked on the door, sat down that man for a good while, and he got saved. The next Sunday, he walked down the aisle and gave his heart and life to Jesus. Or he already did, and made public and got baptized. And I share this because I'm leading into the three suggestions that he told us. Number one, every single member of First Baptist Moreland should know how to share their testimony. Brother Bailey, when he talked to people about the Lord, he told them their testimony. When he talked to that drunk watching college football with beer in his hand. He told them, says, one day I was just like you. It might not have been the extreme, but a lost person is a lost person. No matter, there's not different levels of lostness. You either know the Lord or you don't know the Lord. The Lord can save anyone. And if we're going to be a biblical church, we want to have church members who can tell other people how to be saved using their testimony. And here's what your testimony is. It's a story of your life before Christ. And your testimony should be a minute or two long. It should not be something you stand up for 10, 15 minutes and share your whole life story. I was once lost. I did not know Jesus. I was without hope. That's why Billy Graham pounds on hope. America's searching for hope. There's people walking around just hopeless all around us. I was confronted, step two of your testimony, I was confronted with the gospel. I realized God convicted me. God spoke to me. God met me with His Word and shared with me that you're going to hell. In order to get saved, you have to realize you're lost and you need Jesus. You can't get saved without step one and two. You're lost. God's speaking to you. Then number three, I trusted in Christ as my Savior, and now I'm saved. I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I know at this point in my life, I gave my life to Christ. When I was 11 years old, I walked the aisle of a church. I got wed in a baptistry, and I thought I was saved. I grew up in a Christian home. But I realized when I was in high school that, in fact, I was not saved. I was, I'm a people pleaser. So naturally, I'm going to be the child that's going to please his parents and his youth pastor, the children's pastor. So, I pleased them. But when I was in high school, I realized I had not pleased God. I pleased man, but not God. And I, one night, I was under great conviction. Because the Lord had been speaking to me in church and in youth group and in Sunday school through his work. Daniel, you're lost. Daniel, you're lost. Daniel, you're lost. Over and over, it's very simple. He's reminding you that. And one night in December of 1993, I got down on my knees. I was in a great conviction in my bedroom, and I prayed and I trusted Christ in my Savior. And I made my decision public, and I got baptized later. And I've been living for the Lord since 1993. 
That's nearly 20 years ago. Next month. I've been saved for nearly 20 years. That's my testimony. I just shared my testimony to you in less than two minutes. Do you have a testimony? You should be able to do that. And I want to tell you what I do. I tie in the fact that I'm a people pleaser. I please my pastor, my youth pastor, my children's pastor, my Sunday school teachers, and my parents by getting saved. I was doing what I was expected to do, but I did not please God. Every single member of First Baptist Moreland, I should be able to call you up here on the stage, on the platform, and say, Kayla, Justin, Murphy, let's hear it. And just one after another, you should be spitting out your testimony. If you want to be a soul winner, you need to get this down. Brother Bailey said, his church at First Southern Baptist Church of Oklahoma City, he had 20,000 people that knew their testimony, and they were sharing it with other people. You can start sharing your testimony, people. People get saved. One of the goals for you, and really for our church for 2014, should be we should have testimony classes where you should be able to refine your testimony to one to two minutes and be able to tell to someone. Just one-on-one -on -one conversation. You should be able to do that. That should be a goal. That should be a goal for our church. It should be like a prerequisite for membership. You walk out and get saved, now you're going to learn your testimony because you're going to go tell to other people. Jesus tells us to do this. You, church member, need to know your testimony. Number two, every program, event, and ministry here at our church should share the gospel. Do you know, we do a lot of good things at our church. Trunk or treat we had last week, it was a good thing. But something might be missing in trunk or treat. Upward award ceremony was yesterday. It was a good program, upward. Easter egg hunt we do. It's a good event. But something's missing in our Easter egg hunt. Every single event we have at our church, whether it's youth night, whether it's a concert, whether it's Derek and the choir putting on a musical, whether it's the Christmas Eve candlelight service, whether it's the watch night service next month, every single event should have something. Do you know what that something is? It should have a clear presentation of the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Welcome to our church event. We're so glad you came. Jesus loves you. He died on a cross from you because you're a sinner. And if you trust in Him right now, you can be saved. Brother Bailey shared that he did many of the exact same, he did the exact same events that our church did. But he would always invite or always have someone stand up and share the gospel just a few minutes long and even offer a time of response. The gospel is not that good if you can't respond to it. Well, how sad would it be to go to church that doesn't have an invitation? That people hear the gospel, they fall in conviction, but they're like, what do I do? What, do I make an appointment with the pastor? I mean, I have no clue. You should tell people. Pray, pray, ask Christ to come in your life, and you make your decision public. Jesus can die for you publicly on the cross. You can certainly walk an aisle publicly and make it known that you want to be a child of God. You should not be embarrassed of being a Christian. You should not at all. We need to be. And I, we have a lot of ministry leaders in this church, and I'm not involved in every single planning activity of this church. You need to be able to say, that person when the committee meets, and when the ministry team gets together, you're planning something. You need to be the person that raise your hand and say, we need the gospel share of this event. Every meeting, every event, we have no idea who's lost. We don't know only God knows that. Our job is to share the gospel. Every single time we open these doors, it should be shared. Do not be ashamed. Even if you're in your little Sunday school class, ask people about their heads and say, it's time to do business with God. You're here in Sunday school and you might need to get saved. And speaking of Sunday school, the third thing Brother Bailey said, Sunday school needs to be the evangelistic arm of the church. Many of you say, what does it mean to be evangelistic? Evangelistic means you're sharing the gospel. Your Sunday school should be reaching people in your class, through your class. 
You look at your class, first of all, every single person in this church should be going to Sunday school and be a member on a roll in a class. And you go and you find someone and you invite them to your Sunday school class. Invite lost people. Enroll them in your class. There's a difference between a church member. Church members have to be saved. Anyone can be a Sunday school member. We want lost people on the Sunday school roll because we're there's a lot of people. They might not come to a church service. But if you invite them to your Sunday school class, they will come. I promise you, they will. They'll say, well, I'll come give you an hour from 9.45 to 10.45. I'll come to your class and see what's going on. Brother Bailey said, your Sunday school should be evangelistic. Teachers should be sharing the gospel to children, teenagers, and students, or, or, or adults of all ages, even offering opportunity for them to get saved. And your class should be identifying people who do not know the Lord and inviting them to Sunday school. Brother Bailey said, Daniel, building new buildings doesn't grow churches. He says, I travel around this nation. I preach in huge buildings that are empty. There's a big pile of bricks. People haven't been saved in a year. Years in some of these churches. Buildings don't save churches. What saves buildings don't save people. What saves people is the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you come to church, you should hear that gospel. Whether it's out of the upper field, whether it's in a Sunday school class, and whether or not it's your personal testimony so that you're standing in nifty foods, which is really our enemy here at Morgan. We are a place of righteousness. You go to nifty, they sell beer, cigarettes, and lotto tickets. If we had an adversary here, it would be a place like that, or pile. You go there and you find someone who's throwing their money away, hoping to hit the jackpot for millions, and you say, brother, I need to talk to you a minute. And you tell them about Jesus. If we start doing this, we wouldn't have room for people to pay for a service. That's how Brother Bailey grew First Southern Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. It was nothing special. It was nothing secret. He didn't go to a conference. He didn't have a magic book. He said, the Bible saves people's lives. He said, he told me, he says, Daniel, don't sit around praying for lost people. You know what you need to be praying for? The Bible never once told us to pray for lost people. It told us to pray for workers. The workers go and take the gospel and the people get saved. I want to share something too before we read this here. What Brother Bailey told me. Because I want you all to hear these things. Because I feel that this is extremely pertinent to our church. And it gives us a focus and a direction and a vision. Because I think there's an excitement level. A large young spoke about here at our church right now. If we're not careful, it will die out, and we'll get back to business as usual in December. But Jesus isn't a business as usual God. He's a God that wants people to see them saved and come to know Him. This is what happens in churches. It's something you, we have to be aware of. And it's something the Lord might be speaking to you to this morning. He told me, he says, Daniel, I go into thousands of churches all the time. And this is what happens. If you have a little nine, ten-year-old boy that trusts in Christ as Savior, he maybe pleased his Sunday school teacher, similar to I did when I was 11, and walked the aisle during BBS and he got baptized next Sunday. He got in high school and he dropped out of church. And he started getting involved in things that were wrong and sinful. Then he got in his 20s and he got even worse. He really, maybe every now and then, go to Easter, Christmas. But really, he wasn't in his Bible. He didn't know the Lord. In fact, he lived a very wicked and sinful lifestyle. Brother Bailey has told me, Daniel, there's a difference between a weak moment and a wicked walk. If you have a wicked walk for many years or decades, you need to examine your salvation. So he says what happens, and this is why so many lost church members exist. Then they get in their 30s or 40s, and they decide, you know, I've got a family now, I've made a lot of mistakes, and I'm regretful of those, but it's time to get back in church. I need to have my kids in the youth group. So they start coming to church, and they even walk the aisle and join the church. And they transfer their membership. So they become a member of the church. From the church they were baptized when they were a child of BBS 30, 25 years ago. All of a sudden, now you have a church member who transferred their membership to a church. But they never dealt with the sin, from their unconfessed sin, for 20 years. They have bitterness. They have anger. They have 
neglect of the Word in their life. They've been out of church. They went every now and then. But for the most part, they were away from God. And they're lost. That's how we're getting all these lost church members. They're transferring their membership when they were children, when they really had no salvation. And the reason he shared that with me is because we're going to offer an invitation in a little bit into the service. Wednesday night, Brother Bailey offered, if you know how he did the invitation, he asked everyone to bow their head and pray and ask to receive Jesus as their Savior. Then he asked everybody to raise their hand. And he said that last night because he preached on hell out of Revelation chapter 21. He says, Daniel, there were a lot of hands that went up and a lot of people made eye contact with me. They looked up at me. I saw their faces. There was well over a dozen. 13, 14, 15 people made decisions. It came time for the invitation. Only five or six walked by. He said, Daniel, you should see a lot of decisions in these next weeks and months ahead because there's still lost church members here at First Baptist Moral that do not know the Lord. John chapter 12, verse 20. Look what happened when Jesus passed by. Because I believe Jesus passed by our church this past week. Verse 20 says, Now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, in Galilee, and requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. What a great statement. Sir, we want to see Jesus. This is the same request people are saying today. They don't want to see a show. People want to see Jesus. When people come to First Baptist Moreland, we want to give them Jesus. Beth Moore wrote a Bible study, Just Give Me Jesus. You know, you can come to church and hear everything except for Jesus. This is what we want to see. This is what you want to give the crowd. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Every time Andrew's mentioned in the Bible, he's bringing someone to Jesus. When Billy Graham does his crusades, he does something called Operation Andrew. That means I'm bringing people to Jesus all the time. Just bringing someone to hear about Jesus. Jesus, verse 23, replied to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep, keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Don't miss that statement. Anyone wants to follow me. If anyone wants to be a servant or a slave of me, he must follow me. You do not follow Jesus sitting in the pew when he tells you to get out and respond. You do not follow Jesus if you're raising your hand and saying, Jesus, I'm a child of you, but there's too much pride. I can't do it. He's saying, if you want to follow me, you can get up and follow me. Where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. God honors you for making a decision for him. Brother Bailey said, Daniel, don't let church members, don't let other people, that someone's been in this church for 20 or 30 years, he says, I see it all the time, don't let someone talk about their decision. Someone might get saved if this church has been a member of this church many, many years. And then they'll walk up and say, Brother Dan, maybe you made a rededication. Maybe you just didn't understand. Maybe Brother Bailey was scared of me in, into walking off. Our job isn't to decide people's decision. That's between them and the Lord. And the Bible tells us here, God honors you for making that decision. I would rather walk out five times and be baptized ten times to make sure I know that I have Jesus Christ in my heart then die and not be unsure. Well, I think I got saved while I was in 8th grade. Maybe it was in 12th grade. Then again, a couple of years ago, I heard of the You should not have that type of testimony where this willy-nilly, wishy-washy, I have no idea if I was saved or not when. You should know when you were saved, and you should know when you receive believers' baptism. If you don't, you should get saved and get baptized. Jesus says, when you do that, Father honors you because you can confidently say, I'm a saved, born again believer in Jesus Christ. Verse 28. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and glorified it again. Now God talks to everyone here from heaven. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said it was an angel who had spoken to him. Look at the confusion here going on. 
This is what happens when Jesus comes by. God Lord spoke from heaven. And the people are like, wait a minute, that was thunder. No, it was an angel. Whenever, do you know one of the stories, what it says, when the sower goes up to sow seed, Satan sends the birds to pick it up. He takes away the word from people. That means he creates confusion and misunderstanding. God is not a God of confusion and misunderstanding. You should understand salvation. You should understand your faith in him and your baptism. You should know about these things. If there's one thing you know, that's it. You might not understand the book of Revelation. You should know how to be saved because it's very clear in Scripture. And it was very confusing here. With, they thought it was thunder or an angel. Verse 30, Jesus responded, A voice came, not for me, but for you. Now this is the judgment of the world. Now the rule of the world will be cast out. As for me, I am lifted up from the earth and I will draw all people to myself. People will be drawn to Jesus. He draws people. That's called the conviction of what Jesus does. He convicts people. He said this to signify what time of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, We have heard from the scripture that the Messiah will remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Look at the confusion. They just did not understand who Jesus was. Jesus answered, The light will be with you only a little while longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness doesn't overtake you. Notice that phrase, the darkness does not overtake you. Do you know what that means? That means if you're not careful, the Lord could be knocking and speaking in your heart this week and revive you. Maybe right now, possibly right now too. You need to get saved. And what happens is when you keep telling the Holy Spirit, no, 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 your heart becomes hardened. And then all of a sudden, you don't respond. And you die thinking you're saved confidently when really your whole life you've told the Lord no. Because if you're not careful, this Bible verse tells us in verse 35, darkness will overtake you. Meaning, there comes to a point where you're, just, you're so wicked, you're so far from the Lord, you won't even respond. You can't even hear the Lord's voice. You've been counseled to the darkness. Having a soft, sensitive heart to the Lord is the best thing for a Christian to have. A best thing for anyone to have. That's why when most people get saved, they're younger. Because they're sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. As people age, sin just takes a toll of them. They don't realize how dangerous it is and how hard they've become. Verse 36. Well, you have the light. Believe the light so that you may become sons of God. Of life. Jesus said this, then he went away and hid from him. Jesus preaches his sermons and runs away and hides. Because he knew his sermons would end up quickly on the cross if he did that. He wouldn't have time to finish the rest of his messages. I want to share with you three quick things and we're going to bow our heads. Number one, this is what happens when Jesus comes. This is what happened this week. When Jesus comes, we need to make it easy for people to see Jesus. Look at that question. Sirs, we want to see Jesus. It's hard sometimes to see Jesus because of religion. It's hard to see because of church politics. It's hard to see because of the bad attitudes that people have about church and about people, pastors and ministers. All of a sudden, they just want to see Jesus, and they got a bunch of junk. Say, I just want to see the good news that Jesus saved, and whatever your problem is, He can deliver you from it. That's what these Greeks, it says, they wanted. They didn't want anything else. They wanted to see Jesus. Church, we want to give people. Jesus. Every time we open these doors, we want to remove me and we want to see Jesus. It doesn't matter who's up here preaching, who's teaching Sunday school, who's standing in front of one. You hold up your Bible proudly and say, this is what thus saith the Lord. This is the gospel. This is the good news that people can be saved. Secondly, when Jesus comes, you'll likely miss the message from God. You will. Because when it says when the Lord spoke from heaven, there was great confusion. Some people thought it was thunder. Some people thought it was an angel talking. When in fact it was God the Father speaking. They said, this is my son. You need to listen to him. I'm going to glorify him. I'm going to make him great. Sadly, there will be people here this morning and people at the 11 o'clock service. They'll come here and they'll tune me out. They'll miss what the Lord is saying. A lot of people will miss revival. God had a message for them. He's knocking on their heart. He's speaking to them. And they'll miss a heaven, miss a message 
directly from God. When you read your Bible, you're, you're hearing directly from God. How, if they missed God speaking literally to them back then, 2,000 years ago, how much easier would it be to miss God today? I mean, he was actually talking from heaven in Hebrew to them. And they missed it in their native language. How much easier? Are you missing God today? And not only that, thirdly, it should bother you that people in Newton are walking into hell. It should bother you. People are here more than people in Grant in our community are literally walking into hell. It says the one who walks in darkness, verse 35, doesn't know where he's going. A hopeless life, just wandering around, walking straight into hell, thinking they're saved, Hoping some decision they made when they were a child is going to cover them. When in fact, they have not been covered by the blood of Jesus. They were a people pleaser, like I was. Let's bow our heads. You know, it's time now to do business with God. I'm going to invite, I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. And it's one, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand like Brother Bailey did. But I am going to ask you, as we pray the sinner's prayer, that maybe you were one of those people, that, especially that Wednesday night, all those hands and faces went up and looked at him. You prayed and accepted Christ this week in revival, and you did not walk the aisle. The Bible tells us very clearly to follow Jesus. And when we follow him, he honors us in front of the Father. We saw it in the Word. But maybe you missed the revival this past week, but this morning, you need to be in this group that's going to be getting baptized. Your name should have been on this bulletin insert of all these decisions. And if that's you, I'm going to pray this prayer. There's no better morning than this morning here after revival to get saved. Getting saved in church is one of the best places to get saved. But it's not the only place. You can get saved anyway. I got saved in my bedroom. And if that's you, if you pray this prayer, I'm going to encourage you to walk forward and say, Daniel, I, I missed what Bailey Smith said. I should have walked up. I've been putting it off. He's been knocking on my heart. And I miss Jesus this week. I'm not going to miss him this Sunday. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I am going to ask you to make it public. Because that's what Jesus asked us to do. And here's the prayer I want you to follow along. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. Lord, thank you for saving me. Jesus, from this point on, every day, I'm going to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And I want you to look up. If you prayed that prayer either this morning or this week and you didn't make it public, and you need to be on this insert here in the bulletin. Your name should have been on there. You should have been number 31. I'm going to invite you. You might even be saying, Daniel, I want to get baptized this morning here at Sunday school. I'll go home, grab me a change of clothes. I'm coming back. I want to be in this crowd. If that's you, I want you to make your decision public this morning. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. The band's going to lead us in a song. And I'll be standing down front, waiting for you to respond to the gospel.